Welcome to the weekly update, where I'll go over the action in the market for the week of January 22nd through the 26th, and then we'll see how things look for the week of January 29th through February 2nd. We had another up week. We were up over 1% with the S&P 500. We did set a series of all-time highs. We're also seeing all-time highs being generated recently with the Dow, the NASDAQ 100. We are quite overbought when we look at the daily charts. There are, of course, some things to be concerned about, and I'll go through that in this video just to point these things out to you. And when I look at these negative things, it's not like I make decisions using them. I go with what the charts are telling us, and if we're going up or down. These are just things that I like to be aware of. So in case things really start to fall apart, sometimes this can give us some insight as to why this is happening. Before I get started, please note that last Monday on February, excuse me, January 22nd, I did post a new video called the What to Watch video. I don't know if this is going to be a weekly video. Right now, it's more of an as-needed type of thing where I go through some of the charts just the ones that are really glaring at us right now it's usually a shorter video and you can go through and just pick out the things that really seem to be telling us something and the last video I, I think I'll stick with this format I go through some really good positive things and some negative things just to be aware of what's actually happening then we can take all of this together and try to reach some conclusions also, a PDF is available in every video that I post. Some folks like to download that and follow along. You can sometimes follow the slides with the text that I put on here. Sometimes it's a little easier to see the chart that way. Also, pivot points are posted each day. This is just on the YouTube channel <clears throat> where I only have a community tab on YouTube. And I update a chart every day those are pivot points that last for the whole month. I just update it as each day unfolds. There are intraday pivot points, which are pretty critical, and I watch them pretty heavily. Of course, they renew each day. So if you think that would be a helpful tool for you, please feel free to check that out. I do have a private Facebook group that you're welcome to join. Not an awful lot of back and forth going on there. Sometimes a few posts or comments here and there. But it's not real active. But if you want to join and try to make it active, you're more than welcome to do that. I will be posting a new poll after I get finished with this video. I'll be going over the results of the most recent poll here in just a few moments. Please feel free to leave any comments either on YouTube or Rumble. Now, if they are promoting some kind of a service, they're going to get deleted. If they're garbage comments, if they're crap comments, if they're spam they're going to get taken right out. But if you have a legitimate feedback, either positive or negative, or do you agree? You might agree with what I have concluded. You might disagree. You might have something that you want to interject that maybe I didn't cover. Feel free. That's what it's for. And I like to have back and forth that way. So feel free to post a comment. But if it's a garbage comment, they usually get deleted pretty quickly. I also post these same videos on Rumble, or if you're on Rumble, I post these same videos on YouTube. Sometimes, either on YouTube or Rumble, I may have some uploading problems. It seems to be when I'm uploading a videos, especially during the week, that's a pretty busy time. And sometimes it can really get delayed, especially on Rumble. That seems to be more pronounced. But I've had problems with YouTube as well. I try to get them posted just as soon as possible. Here is the link to the Rumble channel if you want to access it that way. If you can't find me in one location, feel free to go look in the other location and see if I posted something there. Let's go back and talk about the week session. So for the week, we were up 1.06% on above average volume. We trailed off a little bit later in the week, but for the most part, volume was above average and we're seeing that picking back up. We are positive with our technicals. We're looking quite overextended. We have been now for the last few weeks on the daily charts. There are some extreme positive readings that we're seeing here on the weekly charts, but we still have a positive backdrop for right now. It's about inflation and interest rates. The market is still going with this idea that the Fed might be either done raising rates or close to finished, and that they may at least stop for right now. 
the big debate is, okay, if they're going to cut rates, when is that going to happen? And I'll go through some information and talk about that. Of course, there's the recession debate that goes back and forth. We can look at a number of charts that suggest that we're going to go into a recession. We can also see other charts suggesting that we're not going to go into a recession. And then in the upcoming week, the FOMC is going to be making their announcement. They're probably not going to change rates. It's what they say, not only in their statement, but then what comes in the press conference after that. Our trend is still strengthening here, and we're seeing a strengthening trend just start in the short and intermediate term on the daily charts. That's now being confirmed by what we're seeing on the weekly charts. We are positive. The green line is on top. And so we're in a trending environment with all of the different time frames that we look at. So for the week, the Dow was up 0.6%. And then over on the right-hand side, it gives you the year-to-date value. The NASDAQ was up 0.9%. The S&P did okay. It was up 1.1%, a little bit different than what I have. And the Russell 2000 was up 1.7%, but they're still down on the year. We're still wondering if that January effect, which is pretty much gone now, we're getting near the end of January. Of course, that could pick up and carry over into February. But you have a lot of folks that were disappointed. They really liked what they saw in December. It just didn't happen in January. So maybe it will happen later. For the week, just some bullet points. The S&P did set a new all-time high, and the broad market did show some improvement. There were some days this past week when the mega caps did outperform, but there were also other days when they did not outperform. But when you take them all together, they did outperform overall. The discretionary sector, this is what we're keeping an eye on, specifically Tesla right now, since it's such a big company and it has a real impact on discretionary, it's negatively diverging. And it fell 13.6% after it came out with earnings and guidance that were not well received. And then we did have a bunch of earnings that came out. We had Humana, 3M, Johnson & Johnson, AT&T, DuPont, Kimberly Clark, Intel, that wasn't really well accepted. Texas Instruments, KLA Corp, Netflix, which was very well accepted, United Airlines, Verizon, Procter & Gamble. These are names that you've probably already heard of. And so we're really getting into the thick of earnings season now. The economic reports that came out were fairly pleasing to the market. It's like we were building up to these reports coming out, and then we got them, and the market liked it and didn't really do too much about that. But it didn't fall apart either. Interest rates did rise slightly. We were pretty much unchanged from last Friday to this Friday with the 10-year yield. And then internationally, earlier in the week, the People's Bank of China cut its required reserve for their commercial banks by half a percent or 50 basis points. They're having some problems with their stock market. They're having problems economically there. And so they're trying to do some things to stimulate that. And the reason why that is important to us is so many companies, specifically S&P 500 companies, do business with China. And if China is having problems, that could feed over into some U.S. companies as well. This is a chart that I've been showing for over six months now. This is trying to track what was inflation doing from 1966 up to 1982. About halfway through the year, we were following it with the gold line. I haven't been able to find an updated version of this chart, and I don't have the ability with stockcharts.com to overlay different time periods together. But we are seeing declining inflation, and that's what the economic reports have been suggesting. The thing to be aware of is look at what happened after that. There is some talk that, okay, we had the banking crisis almost a year ago. It'll be a year ago in March. Sometimes when these things happen, something initially negative happens, and then it's like being in the eye of a hurricane. Things look like they're getting better, and people kind of forget about it, and then we get hit with something else. There are people out there that are saying those kinds of things. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but we just want to be aware of it. And when those types of things do happen, at least what we saw in the 70s, we saw inflation just skyrocket. In fact, we went through a period of stagflation where we had very high inflation with no economic growth before things finally turned better back into the early 1980s. We are above the 4.02% level that RENMAC has determined. When we get above that level for the 10-year yield, that's when we start getting... it could. You start to erode corporate earnings. Since we're above that level, we just want to be aware of that. Looking at the poll results, this is as of Friday, but the poll was put out a week ago. 
The first question, do you feel the continuing negative divergence between the down and the transports will start to negatively impact stock prices? And we're still watching that, that negative divergence. It's more longer term and it, it's still continuing. 33% said, yes, that will have an impact. 67% said, no, it won't have an impact. Right now, it doesn't seem to have that much of an impact. Do you think that's going to come into play at some point in the future? That's kind of a follow-up thought just to have. Growth is improving, and it's still been showing some improvement, even though in Friday's session it didn't do all that well, especially when we compare it to value. Do you feel that growth will continue to improve or start to decline? It was split 50-50. We did see some improvements this past week. Then stocks, interest rates, and the U.S. dollar index advanced all this week. Again, that was a week ago. Do you feel that the rising interest rates that we're seeing will keep right, or the, the interest rates will keep rising or start to decline? It turns out that most of you were right. Interest rates will chop sideways. That's pretty much what happened. We went up, we went down, but by the time we ended the week, we ended up being little changed. The S&P closed at, all, at an all-time high on Friday. We did not close at an all-time high this past Friday, but we did earlier in the week. Do you feel prices will keep going up, chop sideways, or that this will be a blow-off top that least leads to a decline? 14% thought that we'll keep going up. 71% think that we'll chop sideways. 14% also think that we'll start a decline. We have been going up and we were up over 1% on the week. So we kind of lean more towards the going up side for this one. Here's a couple of charts just to show you how revenues are continuing to look rosy as we go out into the future, which does bode well for stock prices. Also, this is kind of interesting. I talk about this in the Stock Traders Almanac statistics, and I, I just mention it using text. This is actually graphically represent, representing going from 1950 up to 2023, when does the market do best? Is it when Democrats are in control? Well, that's when they tend to do worse. Is it when Republicans are in control? Well, they do a little bit better. They're both positive, but when they're split, that's when the market does the best. And that's what the Stock Traders Almanac also confirms. It's because the markets are afraid the government's going to get in there and screw something up. They they usually don't take rules away. They usually add rules. And these rules usually make things more complicated and can really bog down the market. So when you are split between Republican and Democrat, that tends to produce roadblocks that prevent things from getting passed that otherwise would get passed. Then looking at facts that they had a couple of blog posts, we are coming into the thick of earnings season right now. And it says they're reporting the lowest net profit margin in more than three years for the fourth quarter. Over here on the right-hand side, this is where we're at. I should have extended this red line up here a little bit, but this is where we are at. We're positive, but we're declining at least so far based on where we were reporting in the past. And then what is the update as of Friday? As of Friday's session, 25% of the S&P 500 companies have reported 69% have been above estimates. That's a, It's below the five-year and 10-year average. When you take all of them together, earnings are 5.3% below estimates, which is below the five-year average and above the 10-year average. Okay, And then historical averages reflect the results of all 500 companies. So this is a bit, re bit skewed here. It's Taking into account that all of these companies have reported, when only 25% of them have reported to this point. Getting into our charts, here's the intraday chart. In Monday's session, we did gap higher, and then we just kind of drifted sideways. We also had pretty much a sideways day on Tuesday. Then we did gap higher. We went all the way up to R3. That's where we set the high for the week. That was also an intraday high. And then we saw some selling going into the close. We were pretty sideways to slightly down earlier in Thursday session. And then we saw some late day buying that carried over into the open. Then we set the intraday high there and spent the rest of the day going sideways. So there wasn't an awful lot of movement. Now you could take that as negative. It's like, okay, we're setting all time high. How come the market isn't really going higher? We're dealing with the 4,900 level now. We've never been there before. And so there is some overhead resistance, mostly from a psychological level. You could also take this as positive saying, well, we're hitting all-time highs and we're not seeing a lot of selling going on here. There's a little bit from time to time, but it's not really out of hand 
So for right now, you could also take this positive. So for the week, we had the NYSE up the most, up over a percent. Now, this is just the five trading days that we finished. Then the S&P, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100, and the Dow, where we had the mid caps and small caps were down. Going back to the beginning of 2024, we have the NASDAQ 100, NASDAQ, and S&P doing the best. The Dow and the NYSE are positive, where the mid caps and the small caps are negative. Looking at our different sectors, and I have a, another chart to show you here. You'll notice that there's a new column over on the right-hand side. So the next chart after this is going to be this same. This is called a scooter score. It's kind of like the 0 to 100. The higher the score, the better looking that particular sector. So, But first, we look at just what changed the most since we had an up week. We had energy up the most, which has been just getting hammered lately. And then communication, financials, which are doing better right now. And then the areas that were down were healthcare, real estate, and discretionary. This has been a concern. And this is something that I pointed out in the What to Watch video. I've been pointing this out in the daily videos. We need to see discretionary doing better. And it's just not doing better right now. Now, looking at this next chart and sorting them according to their score, Communication, tech, and financial, they're doing the best. You have these other areas kind of in the middle where staples, discretionary, materials, and utilities, they are doing the worst currently. Here's our relative rotation graph. This kind of shows a little different way what we just saw where we have real estate showing some improvement, financials, and then we're also seeing tech. That's stronger. Where energy, it was way up here before, now it's coming way down here. And when you look over the last year, it's been really underperforming. We're also seeing communication show a little bit of weakness. And then the other areas, we have two of them, three of them showing improvement. That means they're blue. Where we're seeing utilities and materials show some weakness. Then looking at the sectors, energy, communication, financials, and staples, as well as utilities, were up over the last five trading days, all of the other sectors ended up being down. Going back to the beginning of the year, we have tech and communication that are in the lead. All of the other sectors are now negative. Looking at sentiment, we are getting extreme now. We got above that 75 level and we ended up closing at 77. So to look at this historically, when we get up to above this 75 level, that's when we start to look at using this as a contrarian indicator. Now, it still may have some more room to run to the upside, but it just means that the market is getting pretty exuberant. There's not a lot of hedging going on. There's a lot of assumptions that the market's going to continue to go up, and that's usually when the market decides to go in the other direction. Here's the active asset managers. They are showing some improvement, but they're not necessarily extreme positive. And here's another chart showing that we came in at 84.13. It's when we get above 90, we start to get a little nervous. When we get above 100, that's when we get quite nervous. Here is a look at the VIX, where we're still getting low levels overall, but we did come up just a little bit. And we're also getting really low readings when we look at the bar chart. Then the ulcer index, and we're seeing the same thing on the daily chart. This is just suggesting that there's not a lot of fear in the market. When we get low readings like this, sometimes that means that there's a, a change due at some point. The right X bear bull ratio, it did go up, meaning folks are more bullish than bearish. I'm sorry, they're more bearish than bullish. Now, this was as of Thursday's close. It didn't include Friday, but really not much happened. Folks are getting a little antsy here. They, they're expecting the market to go down when it's actually continuing to go up. Kind of interesting how that one's working out. The latest reading from the American Association of Individual Investors, they're positive, but they're not extreme. We're also seeing the red line going up. It crossed above zero, so they're positive. Now, until they get extreme, we can go with this. It's when we get up to a real high reading, that's when we look at using this as a contrarian indicator. When we look at this, we're still positive. When the black line's going down, I know that's counter counterintuitive. That just shows that the tech sector is outperforming cash. That's not what happened in 2022, but since 2023, that has been what has been happening. Keeping an eye on the economy, we just had the latest reading of GDP, so now we're starting to go into the next phase here. The estimate has us up just a little bit under 3%. The consensus is 2% to the top, anywhere from unchanged to the bottom. 
Here's what it looks like going into the fourth quarter. This is what the market's starting to deal with now, where we do have positive GDP, at least as it looks right now. When we look at the spread between risky and not as risky bonds, we continue to decline when we look at this chart. When this is going down, we're, we tend to have more confidence in things. It's when this really spikes up, that's when we get nervous. The latest reading from the financial national financial conditions is also showing a decline. We get nervous when we go above the black line. Now, some of these next charts haven't been updated in a while. This one, if you've been watching these videos, this hasn't been updated since the beginning of November. It just shows how the tightening standards and banks have been lessening a bit. We also, going on just about a month since the real-time SOM recession rule indicator was updated, it came down. We get nervous when it goes above the red line. This was updated at the beginning of January. Again, we get nervous with the recession probabilities when we go above the red line. We're barely above the black line. And the Brave Butters, it's actually declining just a little bit but this hasn't been updated in a while either. Keeping an eye on inflation, we're pretty much flatlined right here with the core CPI inflation. That hasn't changed. It was the PCE that we got on Friday, and there's some adjustments that are happening because of that. Keeping an eye on the Fed. When we look at the meeting coming up this week, January 31st, there's a 96.9% .9 chance that they're gonna leave rates unchanged. There's just 3% of folks that think we will have a rate cut. but So the probabilities are that there's not going to be any changes. So when we look at historically how this has changed, the dark blue areas where we're at now, a day ago, a week ago, a month ago. Where it gets interesting is when we start to look out. And I only go to March, where there had been a lot higher probability that they were going to cut rates. That's this middle area. Now it's starting to look a little bit more like they could keep rates the same. We can see how this has changed, where a lot more folks were thinking that we were going to have a rate cut a month ago. Now that's really fallen as we're seeing more folks getting into the camp that think that at worst, rates are going to stay the same. Looking at the Fed balance sheet, it continues to decline. And it has been declining other than this blip up when we had the banking crisis almost a year ago. We're turning back up just a little bit, but we're still seeing negative outflows when we look at the balance sheet altogether. So looking at breadth, we're looking good when we look at the price up here, and we're showing some improvement based on volume, and we're above the moving averages. So this is still holding up. We're showing some improvements on the daily chart. We're seeing a little bit of a negative divergence where price has been going up stronger than volume has. So we're keeping an eye on that. When we look at our new highs, new lows study, we are showing more new highs and almost no new lows. We're starting to roll down just a little bit with our four-week average, but we're going up with our 10-week moving average. With the advanced decline ratio, we're above zero. That's positive, both with the 19 and 39-day exponential moving averages. Accumulation distribution, this is a smart money indicator. We're above an advancing moving average. We're seeing pretty much that same thing on the daily chart. Here's our trend. We're above the moving average and we're above 20. That suggests a strengthening trend. The green line is on top, so we're positive, and it's looking more positive since the green line is going up. Looking at the Arun, where we are positive when we look at the oscillator down below, that's because the green line's on top and the red line's declining. So this is positive as well. The mass index is not generating a signal. Here's our daily chart where we came up, set a new all-time high, and we've just, the last couple of days have been chopping sideways. We were above average with volume for much of the week, and then that really started to trail off. Here's the latest from the decision point scorecard. It hasn't changed since the last time I showed this. These don't change as often. The trend channel is still positive since we're above the midpoint and advancing. This measures all the way back to 2009. We did break out above this previous pivot point. This was the high that we set last summer. Then we fell back. Now we've been able to break out above that. When we look at the trend, we are still positive. We have the S&P above the red line and both are going up. That is positive. The long-term trend for the S&P is also positive. We're turning back up with the McClellan oscillator, but we're still a below zero here. And we're seeing some negative divergences on the daily charts that I'll show you later. With the summation index, we are coming down after being extreme positive based on price. 
we ticked up just a little bit after almost getting down to the zero level based on volume. So when we look at the Swenland trading oscillator, we're back above zero based on price, that's positive, and we're climbing up based on volume. So this chart is showing some improvement. We're still dealing with that 70 level with the bullish percent index for the S&P. We get a little bit above it, and then we'll get a little bit below it. When we drop below it, that's technically a sell signal, or at least to turn more defensive. But we're still positive since we're above 50. On a momentum basis, we're turning back over and looking more positive on the daily charts. Here on the weekly chart, the PMO is going up. Even though we decline, we're still above zero based on price, and we decline, but we're still above zero based on volume. We're showing some improvement with the PMOs that are rising. The buy signals are showing some improvement, and we're still extreme positive with the PMOs that are above zero. Pretty much the same thing we're seeing on the daily chart. We did spend a couple of days above the upper Bollinger Band here, but on the weekly chart, we're still looking more positive without being extreme positive since we're above the midpoint and not above the upper Bollinger Band. Here is the momentum where we're going up with the slope and the TSI. We're also going up with the MACD, the PMO, and the PPO. We're also going up with the tricks and the KST. Now, we're turning more positive in the short and intermediate term on the daily charts. We're still negative, but improving on the daily charts longer term. But if you look at these, we're getting some really extreme readings here. This could mean that the market is getting a little overextended to the upside. The chicken money flow continues to show some improvement longer term. It's been showing a little bit of weakness lately, but it's still positive on the daily chart. And we're getting a little extreme here with the chicken oscillator. The force index continues to be positive. We're extreme positive still with the money flow index, and we're just a day or so away from a becoming extreme positive on the daily charts. Since we had an up week, we are above the midpoint. And when we go back 50 weeks, we're just starting to break a little bit above this red line. Now we can go well above that, and we've done that before. This is typically an area though, where we just wanna be aware of this going too far extreme positive. The RSI, it's just a little bit over 70 now when we go back 14 weeks. The daily, excuse me, the weekly special K chart is still negative, even though it's turning back up. The daily chart continues to be positive. The Stoke RSI is extreme positive. The Williams percent R is extreme positive, and we're seeing these same things on the daily charts. We're getting extreme positive on the ultimate oscillator, where we're just looking more positive on the daily charts. We're starting to get pretty extreme with the Vortex. We're also positive, but not extreme on the daily charts. The copy curve continues to be positive. It's also switched back over to positive on the daily charts. And there's really not much to show here since we keep going up and setting new all-time highs. We watch this chart the most when we're going down and we're looking for different support levels. We're off into brand new territory here. With our different charts, the Heiken Ashi is still positive. The Kegi chart is positive. The Renko chart is positive. The three-line break chart is positive. We're seeing that same thing on the daily charts. And when we look at the ease of movement, of course, we were up on the week and we continue to be positive going back 14 weeks. Then when we look at the point and figure chart, we did add a couple of new X's in here. We saw one new X drawn this past week on the daily charts. We're still working off of that double top breakout signal that was generated on November 20th. And as long as we keep going back and setting new all-time highs, we will continue to draw in new X's. When we look at the long to really long-term momentum. We are positive in the long-term. We're showing some improvement in the intermediate term and we're positive in the short term. But this is a short-term weekly chart. Then our different trading systems. We're positive when we look at the Elder's Impulse system for the S&P. We're also positive with the parabolic SAR. And we're seeing those same things on the daily charts. Then some daily charts that may be of interest. We were looking a lot better when we compare small cap growth to small cap value. We started to break out, but all we did is get to the upper end of this sideways range that we've been in, and then we've been seeing some weakness. We were looking a little stronger when we look at mid cap growth to mid cap value, but then that has now started to fall back as well. We were showing some improvement with the S&P growth to value ratio, not enough to get back to this previous high, but lately we've been showing some weakness here little bit of a concern for right now. This is another negative divergence that we're seeing. On top, we have a daily chart of the S&P. Here's the discretionary equal weight ETF. 
Here's the Staples equal weight ETF. We follow the ratio down on the bottom. We were setting new highs with the S&P. We're not being confirmed with that when we look at the discretionary to Staples ratio. So that is a bit of a negative divergence. Not saying the market's going to fall apart. Some of that might have to do with Tesla, but we just want to be aware of that. Then we're also seeing this after Friday's session. This is the SKU index, where the VIX measures using at-the-money options. The SKU index looks at out-of-the-money options. We're coming up into this red area now. And when we finally top out and start to come down, that means the market is expecting some kind of a move. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's just a continuation. We don't really know what's going to happen. We just know that the market is anticipating something to happen. The last time we had this reading and it came down, it was really, we just stalled out for a little while and then kept going higher after that. But there's been other times when this actually marked a top in the market. Here's another longer term negative divergence and the debate's going back and forth. Does this really matter or not? where we have the Dow setting all-time highs. The transports haven't even come back to this previous high. I'm not really looking at utilities right now. It's mainly the Dow and the transports that I've been focusing on. Then this is another, I thought this would clear up as we went through the week, but it's still growing here. This is the McClellan oscillator. We're going up with the S&P. The McClellan oscillator has been going down. And in fact, we're still under zero. So that's a negative divergence, but that's shorter term. Now, going back here, when we're below zero, that makes the summation index go down. When we're above zero, that makes the summation index go up. And we're also starting to see a little bit of a negative divergence here. This is longer term, where the S&P has been going up. The summation index based on price has been going down. But if you look at the bottom, which is a completely different indicator, the summation index based on volume has been starting to turn up. Again, we don't know, is this glaring something at us that we need to really freak out about? Well, there's a negative sign here, but there's also something potentially positive as well. We're seeing a very similar thing with the NYSE McClellan oscillator, but instead of being worried about price, we're more worried about volume. We've crossed back above zero with the NYSE McClellan oscillator. So we're starting, and it's really hard to see, but we are starting to turn back up with the summation index based on price. However, we're still declining based on volume. So it's kind of a reverse negative divergence from what we're seeing. So I'll keep watching this. I'll keep talking about it as this unfolds. Looking at the broad market, we're over here in January where we're up about 40% of the time and we usually get a return of about 0.4% if we just take from 2020 up through 2024. Here is just a plain vanilla chart of the S&P mid caps and small caps where we're breaking out with the, the S&P. We haven't come back to the all-time high yet with the mid caps and we have even further to go with the small caps. But the Dow continues to be in an uptrend and is continuing to set all-time highs. The NASDAQ is not back to its all-time high yet, but is still in an uptrend. The NASDAQ 100 is setting recent new all-time highs here and is still in a solid uptrend. Here's a weekly chart of the QQQs where we closed off of the high, but the bar is still continuing to go up. I don't know, is this a doji here? Sometimes this mark might mark some kind of a reversal, just something to be aware of. The mid caps continue to show some improvement, even though they haven't set a new all-time high and they are in an uptrend. The small caps are also in an uptrend longer term. They've been really choppy though, and really not breaking out with much of a January effect. It was pretty much a December effect this year. The NYSE is looking good. This is a broader market measure, which continues to be in an uptrend, but has not set a new all-time high yet. All stocks continue to be positive and are setting new all-time highs. The 30 biggest software companies are up, and we're starting to see more of an uptrend. The FANG index did set all-time highs earlier in the week and still continue to be in an uptrend. ARC is still in an uptrend, but it's been pulling back since the beginning of 2024. The bank index is showing some improvement. We're getting up to an extreme reading with the RSI. We're also looking positive when we look at the momentum. And we've been seeing some real improvement in the whole financial sector. The deposits continue to show outflows, even though this line looks like it's going up. We look at the number over here and it has a minus in front of it. 
When we look at just a plain vanilla chart of Dow theory, where the Dow's breaking out, the transports are not, and the utilities are really starting to go down, which when interest rates go down, utilities tend to also go down, and that often supports stocks. Then looking at the CRB, we did come back up, but we just generated a recent death cross with this trend. Oil is going up a little bit here, but we're still into the 70 range. Copper is really chopping around. It's still in a longer term uptrend, and it's really trying to figure out what it wants to do. We did continue to see more of a bounce in the dollar, even though it's still in a longer term downtrend. Gold is still in an uptrend, even though it has been pulling back. Silver is it, it tried to have a golden cross here, but then we've been falling down below both of the moving averages. So it's really choppy right now. Keeping an eye on the price of bonds, where we are seeing some improvement, even though bonds have been under recent pressure. When we look at stocks to bonds on a monthly chart, stocks continue to outperform. We're still positive with our one month subtracting the three month yield where we should be negative, but it continues to be positive. And we're wondering, is that some kind of a warning sign? I don't know if it is or not, but we just, this is not normal to have this happen. And the fact that this is happening is just something we want to keep an eye on. When we look at yields, we had been declining as we were finishing out 2023. We're going sideways to slightly higher as we start into 2024. Looking at a weekly chart, we were up with the U.S. and U.K. rates. Also, German rates and Japanese rates are going up slightly as well. This is something that I've been showing the last few weeks. This goes back to the early 80s and just shows when we spiked up with the yield, that usually signals something happened, even though we didn't really know it was happening at that time. Well, last October, we spiked up to 5% with the 10-year yield and then started to come down. Now, we're starting to go back up again because there are some spikes here. See, you can only look at this in retrospect, really, and in hindsight. It could come up and actually set another high here. But again, we just want to be armed with information. Some relative studies. Here's intermarket analysis going back to the beginning of the year, where we have oil in first place, and the dollar and stocks are about even with each other. Gold is down, and the price of bonds are also down. When we look at the NASDAQ 100 to S&P, the NASDAQ 100 continues to outperform the S&P, even though both are setting all-time recent highs. The S&P 100 is starting to show some improvement compared to the rest of the S&P 500. It was showing some weakness, and I was bringing this out, but now it seems to be showing some improvement. When we look at growth to value, we like to see this going up, and we're still in a longer-term uptrend, but we want to see this continue to go up to turn more positive. When we look at gold to the S&P, gold is really underperforming. And gold to the dollar, as the dollar has been rebounding, gold has been pulling back. Bonds continue to underperform stocks with a little shorter term chart here. Low volatility stocks with this ratio to the S&P continue to drop off. And discretionary, this is one of the concerns. It's still outperforming staples longer term, but you can see how it's been coming down. We want to see this turn and go back up. And then energy has been really underperforming the tech sector and is in a longer term downtrend with this ratio. Our longer term trend studies, we did set a low back in October 2022. That's still indefinitely on the books. We also had two Zwag NYSE Brett thrusts generated within the last year. And that continues to be on the books. And that's longer term positive. We also had the Zahorchak method finally kick back into a full-blown buy signal. That's also longer-term positive. When we look, go back to the 1987 crash, we're still above the trend line here. And this is a shorter-term look at that same chart, just going back to the beginning of 2018, where we continue to be above this longer-term trend line. We also look at the new highs minus the new lows. I was showing this in a daily video, but this is a long-term chart. The takeaway from this is when we're above zero, that's positive, and we're going up, so it's turning even more positive. I know there's danger in this chart because this is a moving average of a moving average, and I know that breaks some of the technical analysis rules. That's kind of why I like this indicator. But in 2022 and even to a large degree in 2023, we were below this zero level. Now we're starting to come back and we're getting a little bit of distance above the zero level. If we can stay up there, that would be longer term positive. Then we look at the 50 period exponential moving average of the new highs, new lows. 
This is another one that I was showing daily, and I'm just going to switch it over to the longer term version now. We're continuing to go up here. This is more specific just to the S&P 500. And here's the NASDAQ 100. We are above this long-term trend line going back to 2009. This is a ratio between the NASDAQ 100 and the Dow. We're coming up kind of close here at previous points when we hit this. This was the dot-com boom followed by the dot-com crash. This was the climb going into late 2021 and then the problems we hit in 2022. If we get back up to this level again, are we going to hit that and start to come down? Does that mean something bad is going to happen in the future? We don't know. We just want to know about this so that we can be prepared if we see things start to hit the fan when we're looking at maybe the banking situation or the geopolitical situation or some other situation that we don't even know about yet. Here's another ratio, the QQQs to the small caps, the IWM. That's also getting up to a pretty high reading now. But we are still showing some improvement with the NASDAQ cumulative new highs and new lows. They are starting to turn back up after they have been declining for years, but they did turn up before. We want to see this still continue. Then we look at the three-month yield, and we're above where we were back in 2007, and then it started to fall, and we went into the great financial crisis. Now, if we finally start to really move down with this yield, is that going to signal something? We don't know. We just want to be aware of this for right now. And then this is just based on Monday. This is the outlook. We're wondering, is this January effect even, is it over now? We're almost done with January, okay? And then we'll find out later this week after we finish January, are we going to be one for two going forward or 0 oh for three when we score the trifecta? The technicals on the daily charts are positive, and they continue to hold up. So they are showing some improvement, but we are overbought. We're not going to get any economic reports on Monday, and then we follow the geopolitical events, even though it really hasn't had that much of an impact. Yeah, there's a war between Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, there's things going on in Israel, and it's even escalating, but it doesn't seem to have that much of an impact right now. Here's the economic calendar where we're going to have some big things later in the week. We're going to have the Fed make their announcement at 2 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. We're going to get productivity and unit labor costs and ISM manufacturing. That's another pretty influential report. We're going to get the employment situation report on Friday and then consumer sentiment as well. Looking seasonally, just for January 29th, we're neutral to negative with the Dow. We're flat out negative with the S&P. We're neutral to positive with the NASDAQ. And then this is a newer chart. This is saying stocks don't like lame duck election years. Well, we don't have a lame duck now because the current president potentially will be running again. There's some debate about whether that's going to happen or there's going to be some kind of change there. But when you just take this kind of a year, this is how we look. That's the orange line, and it tends to be positive. We do see some weakness as we finish out February before we get into the springtime. We will be on the 19th trading day of the month where we do see a little bit of negativity when we look at the S&P during an election year. This is also another longer term seasonal chart we've been watching where we tend to chop until we get a little further into the year. We see some weakness and then some strength after that. Also, the Stock Traders Almanac, we tend to chop a little bit, see some weakness and then some more strength. Then when the current president is running for re-election, we're kind of starting to match this a little closer now where we started off not being close to this green line at all, but we are showing some improvement as the S&P has been setting new all-time highs. We will be in Monday's session, which tends to be the most positive day of the week. So we have some negative seasonality, but in 2023, Monday ended up being the best day. And then this is also looking further out where as we were finishing up 2023, we hit a bottom and then started to come up. We're wondering, is this going to mirror what we saw after 1982 when we started to bounce back up and then we saw a nice lot of follow through to the upside? We don't know what's going to happen going forward from here. And then going back to 1950, we're up and down split when you look at the S&P during election years. Then the scenarios that we're going with, we're not going with the down one on the daily charts right now, even though we are overbought. We are, if anything, going with the positive side because we are still positive, but be aware we are overbought. We're not going with the sideways trend because we're starting to develop new trends 
in the short and intermediate term on the daily charts, and that is suggesting the trend is getting stronger. And that trend is also positive. The warning signs, I haven't been showing the risk on risk off chart because it's been just chopping sideways. The transports, this is also longer term where they're negatively diverging from the Dow. They're also negatively diverging from the S&P. And this is something that I pointed out earlier on the daily charts, the McClellan oscillators and summation indexes are diverging. We have the S&P diverging based on price. We have the NYSE diverging based on volume. Okay, let's see how that works out. The longer term signals, we're still above those longer term trend lines. And as long as we stay above them, that's actually more positive than negative. But if we fall down below them, we could see a real escalation in selling. The one to three month short term bond spread, it continues to be positive where it should be negative. The three month yield is above where it was back in 2007. And then earnings, we had some were really well received. Others were not well received at all. The positive signs, growth has been showing some improvement. We want to see that kick back into gear and keep going. The equity put call ratio based on five periods, it's been going down, but it did tick up a little bit. We saw a little hedging on Wednesday before we saw the big economic reports coming out on Thursday and Friday. And now that they may be carrying some of these hedges in over the weekend. So it did tick up slightly. Our oscillators are improving but some of them are already extreme positive, just like we're seeing some extreme positive readings on the weekly charts. The parabolic SAR and the vortex charts are both positive. The bullish percent indexes for the S&P and NASDAQ 100 are positive. They're looking more extreme for the NASDAQ 100 and just a little under 70 for the S&P. The Copic curve is positive. Our momentum for the NASDAQ 100 on the daily charts is also positive. Small and mid cap growth, I showed those charts we're kind of coming back down into the sideways range that we've been in. The financial sector is still holding up fairly well right now. The positive signs, longer term, the daily special K chart is positive. The weekly chart is still negative. The longer term equity put call ratio is going down, but it also ticked up just a little bit as we saw an increase in some hedging and then weakness earlier in 2024. The Zohorchak method is positive. The Russell, the small caps and the mid caps they may be all frustrating as get out, but they're still in uptrends when you measure them by moving average crossovers. Our longer term 50 period moving average study of the new highs and new lows is still positive. And then when we look at the S&P 500 to the new highs, new lows study longer term, that's the moving average of the moving average. That continues to be positive. Our cumulative new highs, new lows for the NASDAQ, they are improving. We want to see that continue to go up. And then we've seen two Zwag NYSE breadth for us to buy signals over the last year. They're very rare to happen at all. To see two of them within a year is quite rare indeed. Seasonally and historically, I don't really know what to say about January. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. And then longer term positive seasonality and setups. Those are the longer term charts that I showed. Those are still in the background. So our conclusion, just for Monday's session, we're positive and improving, but we are overbought. Please be aware of those negative divergences. It doesn't necessarily mean things are going to fall apart. We just want to be aware of these things. In the intermediate term, we're showing an even longer list of overbought indicators right now. We're even overbought in the long term because our 150 and 200 period moving average studies are still extreme positive. But in all time frames, we continue to be positive for right now. Thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. I hope you have a great weekend and I will talk to you in the next video.